Today, we can finally take the covers off Intel's latest CPU generation, the Core Ultra series, codenamed Arrow Lake. Now, the Arrow Lake architecture is entirely new, at least for the desktop series, and it uses a tile-based processor design. And the idea here is to move away from those large monolithic chip designs that use the latest node, and instead split the CPU up into blocks, or tiles as they're commonly referred to. This approach has allowed Intel to develop the CPU cores and iGPU using a cutting edge node, while other aspects of the processor, such as the IO interfaces, they can be built using an older, cheaper, and therefore more cost-effective node. And this approach is very similar to what AMD has done with their Ryzen series. With Arrow Lake being such a radical change from the previous Raptor Lake generation, we could really spend the next hour or so talking about the architectural and platform changes. But since the vast majority of you are really just here for the benchmarks, I'll quickly go over the model that we're testing in this video, touch on the new platform features, and then jump into the blue bar graphs. But before we do that, Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped, the men's lifestyle brand setting the bar for men's grooming standards with their new Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver. It comes with two interchangeable contouring heads and allowing you to quickly swap these skin safe blades is the snappy magnetic locators. The four blade foil allows for a super close shave and there's a stubble trimmer if you wanna keep a little edge. Flex adjust technology allows the heads to pivot nicely around the jaw with a precision lock available for even more control featuring three predefined positions. Our favorite feature is the fact that it's waterproof, allowing you to use it while showering to avoid having to clean up. The Chairman Pro boasts 75 minutes of runtime on a single charge, a digital display, an LED light bar, and is capable of being charged wirelessly, making this unit all the more impressive. If you're looking to improve your grooming routine and get an additional 20% off, please check the link in the video description. So, the new flagship is the Core Ultra 9 285K. And yeah, I agree, it's a bad name. And yes, the ultra part is completely unnecessary, but you know, Intel's just following the rules, guys. Modern product names, they're required to be unnecessarily long and just kind of crappy in general. So they've ticked all the boxes there. Anyway, the 285K features eight P cores with eight threads as hyperthreading is no longer used. These P cores feature a base frequency of 3.7 gigahertz with a boost of 5.6 gigahertz and a thermal velocity boost of 5.7 gigahertz. So a 5% frequency reduction when compared to the Core i9-14900K. Then there are those little E cores, and in total we have 16, again with 16 threads as there is no SMT support. The cores operate at a base frequency of 3.2 GHz, but can clock as high as 4.6 GHz, which is actually a 5% increase when compared to the E cores featured on the 14900K. In total, there's 36 megabytes of L3 cache and 40 megabytes of L2 cache. Each of the P cores receives three megabytes of dedicated L2 cache, and the E cores get four megabytes per cluster, and each cluster contains four cores. Finally, the base TDP is 125 watts, with the maximum turbo set at 250 watts. And for this, Intel is charging $590 US per 1,000 units, which will probably mean the retail pricing will work out to be at least $600 US, probably a smidgen over to begin with. It's also worth noting that all K-SKU models, which are the only models that have been announced at this point in time, support dual-channel DDR5 5600U DIMM memory, or DDR5 6400CU DIMM memory. In short, CU DIMM memory features a small clock driver circuit directly on the module, and this allows for more precise timings that are required at higher memory speeds. All models provide 20 PCIe 5.0 lanes and four PCIe 4.0 lanes, along with a direct media interface 4.0 eight lane bus for the chipset. As usual, the K-SKU processors have an unlocked multiplier and therefore can be overclocked. Finally, with Arrow Lake, Intel's moved away from the LGA 1700 socket, switching to LGA 1851. And despite an increase in pins, this new socket keeps the same dimensions and cooler mounting hole spacing as LGA 1700 to ensure continued CPU cooler compatibility with those LGA 1700 coolers. On hand for testing, we have a number of these new motherboards to choose from. And for the bulk of the work, we'll use the ASUS ROG Maximus Z890 Hero and the MSI MEG Z890 Unify X. Now, a substantial number of BIOS releases were required to achieve the performance numbers that I'm about to show you, 
So it's fair to say the Arrow Lake review process was anything but smooth. Basically, it's been a mess from start to finish in just about every way possible. And let's quickly touch on a few of the points that relate to the testing. Firstly, not to make excuses or anything, but we have had a very limited amount of time to prepare this review, as Intel was only able to get us a review kit three days before reviews were set to go live. And let me tell you, three days is not a lot of time to do all of the testing that we'd like to do. So some of the tests that we would normally include in our day one review, they'll just have to be featured in follow-up content. But with CPUs available for purchase on October 24th, we wanted to make sure we had some sort of review to help you with the buying process. That is, if you were to buy one of these new CPUs. Unfortunately, review sample delays turned out to be the least of our worries though, because as it stands right now, Arrow Lake is a bit of a hot mess. So much so that I'm not really sure where to start. So let's start with Windows 11. As many of you will know, Windows 11 24H2 was publicly released a few weeks ago, and this build really improves the gaming performance of modern Ryzen processors, substantially so in some examples. It even helps out the 13th and 14th gen models, but while updating my data, I noticed that Intel's 12th generation was performing noticeably worse on 24H2 when compared to 23H2. But this issue wasn't just limited to the 12th gen processors. I was also seeing serious performance and even stability issues for Arrow Lake on 24H2. And after multiple fresh installs to try and fix the issue, I had to abandon 24H2 and instead test Arrow Lake on 23H2, something I really didn't want to do because there's an inconsistency in the versions of Windows 11 used in our testing, but unfortunately that's just how it has to be if we want to present Arrow Lake in the best possible way we can. But yeah, keep in mind we are aware this is less than ideal as we are aware that games perform worse on that previous version of Windows, or at least some games do. But even with a fresh install of 23H2, we were still seeing some stability issues with the 285K. Games would sometimes crash, as would certain applications, and the situation was worse with the provided DDR5-8200 memory. And this was after more than half a dozen BIOS revisions, two different motherboards, and even a few different fresh installs of Windows. But I'm sure these teething issues will be addressed relatively quickly, though I'm not entirely sure what the issue with 24H2 is. And it's even more confusing given Intel did all their benchmarking on 24H2, but reported no issues. Though we believe they were using the Insider Preview build from back in August. In any case, I have spoken with multiple reviewers who have also run into problems, even on 23H2, and board makers have also confirmed there is a major problem with 24H2. So, my hot mess is the best way I can describe Intel's latest platform at this point in time. Anyway, there's a lot more to discuss, but before we do, let's go over our benchmark data. And for all of this testing, we have used multiple different test systems, but rather than discuss all the hardware used, you're welcome to just pause the video here and examine the test system specs on screen. Feel free to do that if necessary. One thing I will note though, is that I benchmark the 285K using both DDR5-7200 and DDR5-8200 memory. The 7200 CL34 memory runs much tighter timings when compared to the new DDR5-8200 CL40 memory. So if a particular game or application is more latency sensitive, then the 7200 memory might be faster, but if bandwidth is the key issue, the 8200 kit could provide an advantage. Anyway, to find out how that all works out, let's get into the data. First up, let's look at how the 285K behaves under load. For cooling, I'm using the new MSI Mag Core Liquid i360, which was provided in our review kit from MSI. Now this thing is designed and optimized specifically for the use with these new Arrow Lake CPUs. MSI has created a unique bracket that migrates the cold plate north for a three degree reduction in temperature as it better targets the hot spot on these newer CPUs. The cool thing though about this design, no pun intended, is that the unique mounting bracket also provides optimal coverage on LJ1700, AM4 and even AM5 processors. So MSI is touting this as a one-size-fits-all type solution. And with the Core Liquid i360 strapped on, I loaded up the 285K with Cinebench, where I saw an average clock frequency of 4.6 GHz for the E cores and 5.3 GHz for the P cores. And this was achieved while remaining within the stock 250 watt power limit. The CPU saw a peak core temperature of 84 degrees, 
which is well below the 105 degree TJ Maxx. Okay, time to get into the first benchmark graphs, and I have to say the Cinebench multi-core performance looks very good, and we do know the E-cores work really well in this particular workload based on previous models. Of course the E-cores here are entirely different based on an updated CPU architecture, and they're also clocked slightly higher. Using either DDR5 7200 or 8200 memory, we saw a score of just over 2,500 points, making the 285K 14% faster than the 14900K and 7% faster than the 9950X. Then when looking at the single core performance of the Arrow Lake P cores, we see that the 285K is 13% faster than the 14900K and 6% faster than the 9950X. So a great result there. Now for the power consumption data, and this section of the review caused some headaches. But thanks to Steve from Gamers Nexus, I was able to catch the issue with this testing. So thanks Steve, and make sure you go watch his review, they have loads of really great power data. But in short the story goes like this. The Asus ROG Maximus Z890 Hero does something rather unique. Instead of feeding all of the power to the CPU through the dual EPS 12 volt rails as you would typically find on a motherboard, four of the V-Core power stages are connected via the 24 pin ATX power cable. Unaware of this, I was very confused as to how the 285K with a 250 watt limit was drawing just 196 watts. That was until Gamers Nexus Steve alerted me to the fact that around 50 to 60 watts of the power to the CPU was being delivered via the 24 pin ATX power cable, and this had been confirmed by ASUS engineers. So, after a retest using the MSI MEG Z890 Unify X, I was able to confirm the correct EPS 12 volt data, which sees the 285K consume 258 watts in this test, which is certainly an improvement from the 14900K, but also not amazing when you consider the fact that the 9950X was just 7% slower, yet consumes 11% less power. So they're pretty similar, of course, but Intel still lags behind here. And worse still, the 7950X 3D was just 13% slower than the 285K, but it consumed a massive 43% less power. Of course, when compared to the horribly inefficient 14900K, the 285K is a good step in the right direction, consuming 17% less power while delivering 14% more performance in this test. Now, when it comes to compression performance, the 285K is fine, it's not amazing, but it's up there with the likes of the 14900K, 9950X, and 7950X. So again, not amazing for a new generation, but certainly not bad. The decompression performance is quite weak though, and this is largely due to the removal of SMT. As a result, when using the same frequency memory, the 285K is 9% slower than the 14900K and a massive 25% slower than the 9950X. The Blender open data results are good, not amazing, given they're only matching the 9950X, but again, the improved efficiency here is a good result overall. The 285K also isn't amazing in the Corona 10 benchmark. Again, performance overall is certainly good, but it's also 9% slower than the 9950X, despite boosting performance by 17% from the 14900K. Now, although we did see those really impressive single core scores in Cinebench, performance in the lightly threaded Photoshop benchmark kind of sucks, as the 285K came in slightly slower than the Core i5-12600K, making it one of the slower CPUs tested. So this is a highly disappointing result and somewhat puzzling. Thankfully, performance in Adobe Premiere Pro is much better, but even so, we're looking at a slight regression when compared to the 14900K, so not exactly amazing stuff for a next-gen product. Okay, so time for the gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Now, the Ryzen processors did receive quite a big performance uplift in this title with 24H2, and although the gains for the 14th gen processors were much smaller, there were still some gains to be had. Sadly, however, as it stands right now, parts like the 285K are around 5-10% slower using 24H2. So, the 285K data you see here was gathered using 23H2. 
And ignoring the X3D chips, which are just blazing fast in this test, the 285K delivered very mid-range performance, coming in 4% slower than the 14900K. Also, the lower latency DDR5-7200 memory was faster than the 8200 memory in this particular example, though only slightly. The 285K was impressive in The Last of Us Part 1, delivering 7800X3D light performance, making it a few frames faster than the 14900K, though with the same 7200 memory, we're only talking about a 2% uplift here. So again, for a next-gen product, that's kind of underwhelming. Some might even call it a bit of a flop. Now this is where things go a bit off the rails, and in a big way. I suspect you're going to see some reviews where the 285K is similar to the 14900K in Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty, and it's almost guaranteed that those reviews will either be using the built-in benchmark, or testing a section of the game that isn't particularly CPU demanding. And I have some evidence for these claims, which I will show you a bit later on in the video. But if you test one of the more CPU demanding sections of the game, the 285K falls on its face. And I've spent a considerable amount of time trying to extract more performance out of this chip in this particular game. And the best results have come from using lower latency memory. So tightening up the memory timings, that seems to help the most here. But I've also tried motherboards from MSI, Gigabyte, ASRock, and ASUS, all of which delivered the same underwhelming results. I've also tried multiple different versions of Windows and Windows installs. In the end, the 285K ends up at least 20% slower than the 14900K in this test, and is in fact the slowest CPU that we've tested. And sadly, this data, it's not an outlier in our testing. Now, performance in Hogwarts Legacy is certainly much better, but it's still very poor overall, coming in behind the 14900K, and is therefore slower than even the 7700X. It's incredible just how much Windows 11 23H2 was holding back the Zen 4 and Zen 5 processors, as we now regularly find the 7700X offering similar performance to that of the Core i9 14900K. And of course, the Intel CPU is also no longer running without power limits, which does shave off a little bit of performance. Now, ACC sees the 285K drop off the 14900K by a 5% margin, making it 14% slower than the 9700X and 32% slower than the 7950X 3D. So Arrow Lake isn't a great choice for this particular driving simulator. The Remnant 2 provides the parity type data that Intel promised us, and the 1% lows are quite a bit better on the 285K when compared to the 14900K. Still, despite matching Intel's previous generation flagship, the 285K was still much slower than the Zen 4 X3D parts. Now, another game where the performance of the 285K tanks to the bottom of our graph is Homeworld 3. Here we're looking at Core i5 12600K like performance, making the new Intel processor almost 20% slower than the 14900K and 7950X 3D, while is at least 23% slower than the 9700X. Performance is also shocking in a Plague Tale Requiem, and if you've seen other reviews reporting much better results in this particular title than what you're seeing here, please watch the entire video as I will explain what you're possibly seeing. For now, looking at this graph, the 285K is bad, allowing for just over 120 FPS on average, with 1% lows in the mid 70s. And this means it's at least 17% slower than the 14900K and 27% slower than the 7950X 3D. Again, we're looking at Core i5 12600K like performance, making it much slower than even the Ryzen 5 7600X. Moving on to Counter Strike 2, the results here are more like what Intel suggested we'd expect to see for gaming. And that is the 285K roughly at parity with the 14900K. So good to see that this is sometimes the case, but a massive stretch to consider this the norm. Certainly based on what we've seen so far, and of course this is still a very underwhelming result in its own right. Now this is odd. The 285K delivered the best performance we've seen in Starfield, narrowly beating the 14900K to make it faster than even the 7950X 3D. Using the same memory, it was just 2% faster than the 14900K, so that in itself again, while one of the best results we've seen in this game, it's still a highly disappointing result for a brand new CPU generation. 
Space Marine 2 played fine on the 285k, though this new flagship is only offering mid-tier performance, coming in slower than the 14700k for example, roughly matching the Ryzen 7 7700x. So not a disaster, but far from good. The 285K looks decent in Hitman 3, it's certainly one of the fastest CPUs in this title, but it's also slightly slower than the 14900K, it's just 2% slower, but slower all the same. So it's difficult to get too excited about this result as we're looking at 14700K performance. Now for testing Watch Dogs Legion we are using the built-in benchmark, but the data is based on a 6 run average, as the results for the first few runs are often inflated. So you can compare your system with our data if you wish, but you need to take an average from six runs, and that's six back-to-back -back runs. Anyway, doing so reveals some extremely underwhelming results for the 285K, which was only able to match the 14600K and 9600X with 162 FPS on average, and this made it 11% slower than the 14900K and 20% slower than the 7950X 3D. And finally, the last game we have tested here is Star Wars Outlaws, which is a very CPU demanding game. And again, the lower latency DDR5 7200 memory provided the best results in our test with 134 FPS, the same level of performance seen from the 12900K. So that's going to do it for our highly disappointing gaming results. Now for a quick recap, here's how the 14900K and 285K compared side by side, both using DDR5 7200 memory. On average, the 285K was 6% slower across the 14 games we tested, with big losses seen in Watch Dogs Legion, A Plague Tale Requiem, Homeworld 3, and Cyberpunk 2077. Now again, where Arrow Lake makes its greatest strides is in power efficiency, and again, while much improved from the 14900K, the results still aren't great when compared to the Ryzen competition. Testing with Cyberpunk, we saw a massive 32% reduction in power usage for the 285K when compared to the 14900K, but that's still 28% more power than the 9950X, and performance for the 285K was a bit broken in this title, actually it was very broken, so let's take a look at a game where the 285K did really well. And that game is The Last of Us Part 1. Here the margins though, they look pretty much the same. The 285K consumed 32% less power than the 14900K, which is super impressive given it was also a few percent faster. But, disappointingly, when compared to the 7950X 3D, the 285K consumed 71% more power for the same level of performance. So that's not good. Sadly, Intel is still miles behind AMD when it comes to power efficiency, and while shaving off almost 70 watts from the 14900K is certainly great, it's still not really enough, at least at the current performance level. Okay, so if we look at the 14 game average, we see that the 285K is 5% slower than the 14900K, and that's when calculating using the Geo mean. And this means on average it's slightly slower than the 7700X, making it about as fast as the new 9600X. Which is quite shocking, we had Zen 5%, now we've got Arrow Lake negative 5%, doesn't really have the same ring I know, but I guess I'll just quickly move on. Uh, it's also on average 14% slower than the 7950X 3D, and here we can see just how well the Ryzen processors have benefited from the 24H2 update. I mean, for example, the 7800X 3D, it's 14% faster than the 14900K, which is absolutely insane. I had to double check that data because it just didn't seem possible. Of course, we are now limiting the Core i9 part, and I'm not sure what the latest microcode updates do for performance. I was under the impression it didn't impact performance too much in the negative sense, but whatever the case, an absolutely incredible margin is seen between these two parts now in the latest and greatest games. Now, normally for our cost per frame analysis, for CPUs at least, we also include the cost of the motherboard and memory. But with the parts we're comparing here today, which are typically quite high-end parts, stuff like the motherboard and memory prices, they're all really much the same. So while it might reduce the overall margin slightly when calculating all of that stuff, things will look pretty similar. And that is to say the 285K doesn't shape up too well for gamers. In terms of value, it's actually very bad for gamers, offering similar value to that of the 9950X, which isn't known to be a particularly great value gaming CPU, and that makes it much worse value than the 7950X 3D, which is probably the best all-rounder right now, I'd say. It's also much worse than the outgoing 
14900K, despite all the troubles that particular chip has had. And I should note, we don't recommend that chip and we have never recommended it. Quite shockingly, the 7800X 3D, which has sold for as little as $340 US this year, is still worlds better in terms of value at $480 US. So even with the recent outgoing price hikes for that part, it's still holding up really well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Arrow Lake's gaming performance was even worse on Windows 11 at 24H2. And Intel is aware of this issue and they've suggested that reviewers should enable the high performance or high power profile in Windows for the best performance on 24H2. They also thought there might be an issue with the ring bus clock with 24H2 and suggested changing the CCF Auto GV setting from Auto to Disabled in the BIOS. So as I was wrapping up my testing and thinking about maybe I could get some sleep at some point in time, there were a few other things that I had to explore. So I've done so with a limited set of gaming benchmarks to see what we could find. I've also taken the time to include a fresh install of Windows 10, as I know many of you still use this operating system, so you're no doubt interested to see how the 285K performs using this older version of Windows. Okay, so I've highlighted the 23H2 data that I just used to evaluate the 285K's performance. Now, interestingly, the average frame rate increased by 3% when using Windows 10, so that's good, but there's a good chance we'd also see a similar or possibly even better performance uplift for a part like the 14900K. Then we have the default 24H2 configuration, which uses the balanced power profile, and this crippled the 285K reducing the average frame rate by 8% from our 23H2 install while slashing the 1% lows by a massive 36%. So something is very wrong here, and it does seem as though it has something to do with the power profile as the high performance power plan boosted performance back up to 150 FPS on average, which is still less than what we saw in 23H2, but it is a big improvement all the same. Now it seems as though the 285K performs best in Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty when using 23H2, as going to Windows 10 saw us drop a few frames, though you could say the results were within the margin of error. Oddly though, 24H2 worked best with the balance plan, as the average frame rate regressed by 3% when using the high performance profile. Also, the CCF Auto GV option did nothing here, and this was also the case in Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Now, the Homeworld 3 data highlights just how messy this Arrow Lake testing has been, though these results do make some sense. We know Homeworld 3 performs poorly on 23H2, as 24H2 is much faster when testing with Intel 13th, 14th, and AMD Ryzen processors. So the fact that Windows 10 is almost 20% faster than our 23H2 install makes sense. However, what doesn't make sense, at least initially, is the fact that the 285K doesn't improve on 24H2. Well, that is until you manually adjust the power plan, and now we're receiving performance that matches that of the Core i7-14700K. Unfortunately for Intel though, we have to pick a single OS configuration and test that. We can't just pick the best results based on four different configurations, and there appears to be no option where everything works correctly, at least at this point in time. A Plague Tale Requiem was a mess on the 285K, and sadly 22H2 and 24H2 can't fix the problem. In fact, the configuration I used for testing provided the best results. Also, it's odd how slow Windows 10 is here, but I have tested all 14 games and I did see a few examples of this, so there's probably some optimizations that aren't present on Windows 10. Finally, we have Counter-Strike 2, and here the 23H2 install matches what we saw when testing with Windows 10. Meanwhile, 24H2 is much slower, no matter how we configure it, though changing to the high performance profile did help a bit. Just lastly, I should note that all the gaming benchmarks that you just saw didn't have Intel's APO or application optimization feature enabled, and this feature was not enabled by default on our motherboard, at least with the current BIOS used for testing, but Intel says this will be fixed with a future update. I didn't really worry about this though, for two reasons. Firstly, of the 14 games that we test with, just two of them feature APO support, and those titles include Counter-Strike 2 and Cyberpunk 2077. Out of interest though, I did go back and enable APO, and found performance in those titles only changed by about 1-2%, to which is within the margin of error. So either APO does next to nothing in those titles, or it's not working correctly yet, so this is something we'll have to revisit in future content.
Now, something that confused a lot of viewers when it came to the recent round of Zen 5 reviews was the inconsistent benchmark results, namely the gaming benchmark results. And there's a number of valid reasons for why that was. Some of these reasons include just testing different games. But even in the examples where the game list overlapped, results can still differ due to how the game is being tested. And I don't just mean the quality settings used, but also in-game testing versus built-in benchmarks and the latter of which generally isn't that CPU demanding. But even when it comes to in-game testing, the results can still vary considerably depending on where it is that you're testing within the game, or I suppose more precisely how CPU demanding that section of the game that you're testing is. So we're no doubt going to see this again with the Intel Core Ultra reviews, and with how messy the testing has been to begin with, I expect this situation to be even worse. Now, one such example that I'm confident you'll come across if you watch enough reviews will be seen in a Plague Tale Requiem. I was talking with another reviewer who found that the 285k was actually faster than the 14900k in this title, which shocked me given I found the 285k was 17% slower. So that's a massive difference to find when comparing the benchmark results between different reviews. And again, if you come across those results, it's no doubt going to be a bit confusing. And not wanting to discount that as some kind of testing anomaly, I dug in to find out what was going on, and fortunately I was able to work out what was going on. And better yet, I can clearly show you the issue. But put simply, again it came down to where we were testing in the game. I had found a particularly CPU demanding section where the other reviewer was testing the very start of the game, mostly for convenience as it was a newly added title to their battery of benchmarks, so yeah, cut them some slack. So here's a look at the benchmark paths from the start of the game. As you can see, the 285K performs very well, delivering over 160 FPS for the bulk of the test. We are only looking at the average frame rate here, but you get the idea. Both CPUs are very evenly matched. Also, please note this isn't how we benchmark CPUs. I'm merely using the hardware info overlay for presentation purposes. And doing so while recording does involve some overhead. So without all that stuff going on, performance would be a little bit higher for both configurations. Anyway, as you can see, the 285K was actually up to 5% faster when testing at the start of the game. And once we finished the downhill pass, both finished with roughly the same frame rate. And this is because we're mostly GPU limited in this test as the CPU load is quite light. But if we jump further into the game where I do all my testing, so this exact pass here, we see that the CPU load has increased, and although the percentage isn't huge, remember these CPUs have loads of e-cores that are doing nothing during this test, so that is to say they're largely sitting idle. But right away things look very different. Not only has the frame rate dropped considerably for both configurations, but the 285K's performance has tanked, dropping well below 100 FPS at the start of our test, making it a little over 20% slower than the 14900K. It never recovers either. Midway through this pass, it's still around 20% slower, dropping more than 20 FPS behind the older Core i9 part. So this really highlights the challenge of CPU gaming benchmarks. It's considerably more challenge than most GPU benchmarking, which is quite easy in comparison. So there you have it, a massive mess of results that often don't seem to make too much sense. So, you know, as reviewers, we always love to see that. There is clearly a large number of issues that Intel needs to address here, and while I certainly never expected them to flawlessly execute on a new platform and CPU architecture release, I had hoped it would be more polished than this. Depending on the hardware and software configuration, I found that stability could be a problem, but I expect this will be something that gets addressed quite quickly, but even so it is worth being aware of. Now I did notify Intel of my poor gaming data earlier in the week, so they've had quite a few days to look into it, and they have come back to me with a few options, though nothing has really worked, at least not to the degree that I'm satisfied with. So as it stands, gaming performance is a mixed bag to say the least. Overall, what we're seeing here is very poor from a next generation flagship product, and if Intel are unable to make significant improvements here, then Arrow Lake will end up being a flop for gaming. For productivity, the 285K looks a lot better, but it's still not great. And while I am certain there will be workloads where it does really well, there are plenty where the performance is underwhelming when compared to the 14900K and 9950X. What has massively improved from the 14900K is power efficiency. 
So it's not all bad news. The 285K does make significant strides here, and while that's great news, in most instances it's still miles off where it needs to be in order to really compete with AMD. The price also sucks, let's be honest. It's expected to land at around $600 to $630 US, which is just way too much money for what we're seeing here. And for the same money, you can pick up the 9950X or 7950X 3D, while the 7950X is even cheaper at $510 US. And any one of those AMD CPUs is a better option in my opinion. Even if Intel is able to 100% solve the stability issues that we ran into, fix the performance on Windows 11 24H2 while also addressing the just inconsistent gaming performance in general, the 285K can at most in my estimation command a $500 US asking price. So given all of that, I'm obviously not recommending the Core Ultra 9 285K, at least at this point in time, and I likely won't until all of those things have been improved. As for stuff like overclocking, because there is apparently a lot of overclocking and tinkering and tuning that can be done here, but given all the issues that we've run into and just the need to explore performance on multiple different versions of Windows, I deprioritized overclocking for the day one review. Overclocking is something that I'll no doubt look at in future content, but for now it's somewhat irrelevant given the numerous issues that need to be addressed first. There's also the topic of memory overclocking, and while the review kits were supplied with DDR5 8200CU DIMM memory, this memory doesn't really make sense given the extreme price tag, and of course the limited performance uplift. I'm not even sure what this memory will cost, but I know the standard 8200 UDIM stuff is priced near $300 US, and that's for a 24GB kit, so presumably the newest CU DIMM kits will be even more expensive. Therefore, something like DDR5 7200CL34 for around $115 US for a 32GB kit is going to make far more sense. But again, once those issues that we've already spoken of are addressed, I will produce some memory scaling content to work out what the sweet spot is for Arrow Lake in terms of memory support. Wrapping this review up, I think there is potential for Arrow Lake to get a lot better, given it does appear to be undercooked at this point in time. So although I strongly recommend you don't rush out and buy into this new platform just yet, I'm not willing to completely write it off at this point. So yeah, like I said, potential here for Intel to possibly recover, but you know, that is yet to be seen. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this review. And of course I will continue to test Arrow Lake as we receive new updates and stuff like that. And we do have a few more CPUs to look at. So I'll probably speed run those reviews and because we've addressed a lot of that sort of stuff in this video. Anyway, if you did enjoy this video, like, subscribe, do all that stuff, hit the join button. Um, if you want to become a Harbour Unbox member and get a few extra perks, we also have Patreon. Both give you access to our exclusive Discord server. There's some behind the scenes content stuff there, Q and A's, a lot of cool stuff. So check it out if you're interested. But if not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this rather long video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.